Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's third session of our Summer Kids Club. Now, this session is for our curious crabs out there. This is uh, primarily intended for third through fifth graders, but honestly, we recommend and welcome anybody to join us today. Today, we're going to be learning about tide pool habitats. Now, before we do that, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Emily, and I'm broadcasting live from the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. I'm also joined here by my friend Olivia, and we are going to show you all around a really cool neighborhood that we have here off of our coast in Southern California. Now, let's take a moment and um, for those of you that are out there, if you want to participate with us, feel free to text us. If you're watching this live, you can text us right here at this phone number, 562-286-1838. If you're not watching this live on Monday, August 1st at 11 a.m., feel free to email us at the email that's right below. It is live, L-I-V-E, at lbaop.org. Also worth noting, for those of you who choose to text, maybe with the help of a grown-up in your house or your school, wherever you're watching from, um, text rates do apply. So just make sure you know that. We'd love to hear from you, though. Olivia and I are ready to take your questions, take your observations as we explore this local habitat. Now, when I think about the ocean, sometimes I think about the big blue sea out there, right? And maybe going to the ocean for us is going to the beach, right? Have you ever been to the beach? What's it like when you're there? Hopefully sunny, maybe not. Sandy, right? There's lots of creatures. Maybe there's not that many creatures. But have you ever been to a rocky beach? So where there's big, you know, maybe there's uh, stretches of sand and there's rocks. Have you ever been down to where those rocks meet the water? So here in Southern California, we have all these rocky beach habitats. Uh, it's a special place that's, it's, it's actually really unique to our area where we have these rocks, or well, it's, there's a lot of tide pools out there, but there's rocks and there's water. And uh, it looks a little bit different than the traditional beach, so check it out. But if you were to dig in deeper and notice what was actually there, it turns out there's tons of creatures there. Have you been to a tide pool? looks kind of like this. Take a look. And today we're going to be exploring kind of all the creatures, all the critters that live in these tide pool habitats. Now take a look at this picture right here. And I noticed there's, there's a couple things that I noticed about living here. So if you were a little creature that lived here, what are some of the uh, things that happen in this area like so let's say you live on a rock and let's say we live right here on a rock hmm how might this place change over the course of a day well let's think about it so put on your scientist goggles your scientist brain and let's think about what how does this day how does this or sorry how does this habitat this place in the ocean change over the course of the day well right now i notice in this picture Seems like it's pretty bright there, right? It's pretty bright out. But we know that if this was actually a movie, the waves would be coming in and out, right? And maybe splashing around. So living in a space like right at the edge of where the land meets the water can actually feel really different over the course of the day. So let's give one more moment to think about it. Is this a tough area to live in or maybe an easy area to live in if you live right at the edge? right at where maybe the rocks meet the water. Hmm. We talked about that it might move a whole lot. What else might be happening there? This picture looks pretty sunny. So my guess is that during the course of the day, if it's sunny out like this picture, it can be pretty hot there. Could be underwater some of the time. Maybe if the tide comes in, can you imagine if this water line got a little bit higher? and you only saw the tops of the rocks, maybe you live underwater sometimes and above water sometimes. That makes this habitat, the tide pool habitat, a pretty extreme habitat, just because over the course of the day, the creatures that live there see all different kinds of conditions. Now, I know right now we can sort of see some of the creatures that live there. Can you see any right now? If you look really close, 
you can actually see that the rocks have like all these like textures on them, right? Does anybody know what those are? There's, there's shells and things like that. And then down below, it's a little harder to see. So we're gonna go and show you sort of an underwater image of what one of our tidal habitats here at the aquarium looks like. And we can sort of think about that and take a look at what we notice there. So if a tide pool habitat changes a lot during the day, in fact, there's a lot of movement, you can see a little bit of movement right here. So take a moment right now and think about this. Can you come up with a list of maybe three things that you notice about the image that's right behind me? What are three things that you notice? So take a look right here. Hmm. Does anybody see rocks there too? Are there rocks in this habitat? There's definitely rocks. What else do we notice? Now, what we're really lucky uh, in this habitat that's here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, it also happens to be really brightly colored, right? So there's a bunch of different creatures. They're brightly colored here. Maybe you noticed the thing that's moving the most, the two, two, three things that are moving the most right here, these fluffy looking ones. These are sea anemones. Well, there's a greenling, a fish. Right there. So we see that there's all these anemones. We see all sorts of other creatures maybe that aren't moving quite as much. So let's start today. Um, and we also notice, I notice there's a bunch of rocks. And this whole exhibit right now is underwater. So we're, it's kind of like looking at an underwater view, sort of a, a cutaway section of a tide pool habitat. It starts with rocks and water, just like our coastal beaches. But inside those little pools that are formed by those rocks and water, we have a whole community of animals that live there. So let's start first with the anemone, since it's moving the most today. Let's take a look. Um, Olivia, can we look at a picture of an anemone for a moment? Let's take a look at this picture of the anemone. What are some of the things that you notice about it? Does it look like anything else you've ever seen before? Yeah, you know, if you're like me, you might be thinking, First, I don't see a face. Second, it kind of looks like a plant, right? Almost like a flower, like a creature flower almost, right here. So this is a living animal. This is an animal and uh, it, it does have sort of like plant-like look to it. But let's take a closer look. So these little tentacles are all around the outside, almost like petals on a flower, but this is an animal. So what might it use its tentacles for? Hmm. If you said maybe, maybe it stings with its tentacles. Yeah, they certainly do sting with their tentacles. They also use it to eat. So they can grab their food and use it to eat. And how would tentacles be helpful in a tide pool habitat? Let's go back to that video for a second and just check out the anemones and their tentacles real quick. All right, so. How do you, what do you notice about the way that these are moving right now? Yeah, they're sort of moving with the current, right? Do you see the anemone moving otherwise? Is it, can it get up and go anywhere? Uh, no, definitely not. You can almost see, it almost looks like it's suction cupped, right? To the rocks right here. So it turns out animals that don't move a whole lot, these are, uh, they, they could, if they needed to, or if they got uprooted off of a rock, they could replant themselves, but they don't often do that. So that since they don't move a whole lot, they have to find other ways to feed themselves and protect themselves. That's why these tentacles are really, really helpful. So we can see that they're able to move around. Those tentacles are really flexible. It's a good adaptation for living in a tough area. So they're able to catch their food this way since they can't move real well, they, ha they can sort of reach through and grab the things that get pushed by as the water moves. Excellent. Um, Olivia, do we have another picture too of maybe a closed anemone? I think the other tide pool picture that we have, um, it, or maybe we don't have it on this one. So, uh, oh, here we go. So this is another, this is sort of, instead of like the side view of a tide pool, this is sort of the top view of a tide pool. Check this out. Do you see the anemones here? Yeah, there's a bunch of them here, right? So they come in all these different colors. I noticed that too. Here's one, 
Here's one. There's a bunch of them over here with sort of like the white stripes on their tentacles. But uh, the one I want to point out to you is this one. Now, you're like, wait, it doesn't have, I don't notice the tentacles at all, right? So what happens is they are feeding and when they catch food, they sting it with their tentacles and then they put it into that mouth that's in the middle and then they often close up. And when they close up, that's what they look like. To me, it kind of looks like a, a jelly donut. Has anybody ever had a jelly donut before? It's kind of what it reminds me of. It sort of closes up and there, you can still see the little mouth opening at the very top of it but it's all closed. It's protecting itself while it's busy eating. And so, or it wants to shield itself from maybe predators. And so, um, so that's what they look like when they're closed, which I think is kind of neat. So it's just still, you can still see the pink on the outside. You can see that great circle shape, um, but it is pull, it has pulled all of its tentacles inside there. This is also a great thing to be able to do if the water level gets low enough and they just want to make sure they don't get all dried out by having their tentacles out. So they just hold in the water and they buckle down. And so sometimes when you visit the tide pools, uh, you'll actually see a bunch of these will be closed up, especially if they're at that point that's sort of above the water. All right. That's our first creature of the day for the tide pool exploration. Uh, remember, if you would like to send in your observations or you have any questions about what you're seeing, feel free to text us at the number below, 562-286-1838. Let's take a look again at this image. Once again, this is the top view. So this is almost like if we could fly over or snorkel over a, a tide pool habitat, this is what it would look like. So you have, there's rocks all around, there's water. In between the rocks, there is actually sand down there. But take a look, what else do you notice in this habitat? What other creatures do you see? If you're like me, you probably notice there's a bunch of these, right? Of sea stars. I'm gonna step back again for a moment. And I would love for you to take a moment to see if you can notice at least four different kinds of sea stars. Okay, so take a look right here. Are there at least four kinds of sea stars? Do you see some that look similar? Any that look different? Hmm. Now this tide pool is actually more like the kind of tide pool you might see off of the coast of Washington or Oregon, a little bit slightly cooler water. Although our tide pools here in Southern California have some of these animals too. So some of these animals um, can live in a lot of different places. So let's see if we can find at least four kinds of sea stars. Um, the first one I pointed to right here, what do you notice about it? Sort of pinky orange color, has those like white dots on the top. What do you think it would feel like if we actually touched it? Smooth or rough? It looks rough, right? It definitely looks rough. Yeah, these are this sea star, this is called an ochre star. And in this picture right now, we have two types of, uh, two colors of ochre stars. Okay, so we have this orange one. There's a couple of other orangey ones. Oh, here's one. We have one that's actually kind of like reddish purple. And we have actually this purpley one right here. There's another one that's like reddish purple, or no, sorry, orangish red. And then there's a couple of like the orangish red ones up here too. So we have a couple of these ochre stars. I actually think they feel like, if you've ever had pretzels with salt on the outside, they sort of feel like that, like the little bumps on them right there. Okay. Any other types of sea stars that you notice? Let me step out of the side. Now, we definitely can tell when they're sea stars, right? like this. It's very star-shaped. It has five arms. So let's see if there's anything else that looks kind of like it, but not quite. You notice this one right here? I just saw that one too, actually. Um, this one kind of reminds me of Patrick from SpongeBob, right? It's kind of like, I'm pink and I'm right over here, right? This is called a bat star. So just like there's a Batman and a Batmobile, there's actually a bat star also. This one actually comes in a bunch of different colors, but I think orange is the only one that we have in here right now. They sometimes range orangish, pinkish, purple. Um, and so this is like a reddish orange one right here. So we've got two types of sea stars right now. These sea stars happen to have five arms. Anybody see any other types of sea stars here? 
Oh, I see one oh, all the way over here that looks a little bit different than the rest, right? What do you notice about this one? Did, did anybody spot this one too? What do we notice? Yeah, it looks like the bumps on it look a little bit different. Take a look at that. I wish you could zoom in real quick. But the bumps are kind of like two colors. So there's white in the middle, and it looks like sort of like a purplish color around the edges. So this is called a knobby or spiny sea star right here. Then anything else? Any other different ones? I think this one might be a different one. It's a little bit hard for me to tell. This one almost looks like a leather star to me, but it's missing a little bit of blue on it. So maybe there's actually a, maybe it's a false ochre. And then take a look up here. For those of you that spotted this teeny one hiding right above my head there, um, that looks maybe a rainbow star. It almost looks like it's got stripes on it and the skinnier arms. Now, the sea stars that we're seeing in here, they have those five arms. I wonder if, do we have any pictures of anything with more arms by chance? Let's think about it too. If you were a creature that lived on rocks, uh, where there's rocks and water and lots of water movement, like there's high tide, low tide, the waves are crashing, how would you use your arms? It could be useful to have arms, right? What else do we know about sea star arms? So let's see if we can find any pictures that teach us a little bit more about sea star arms here in just a moment. Whoa! What do you notice here? Yeah, there are lots of arms in this picture. I'll have to look. I think it's like 18 maybe in this picture. But whoa, whoa, what, what are we even looking at though? This sea star looks so different than the ones we just saw in that video. Huh. What does it look like to you? Wait, which side of the sea star are we even looking at right now? Of course, I couldn't trick you at all. This is the bottom of a sea star. And we know from our past experience, and maybe we've read about it in books, the sea stars are sticky on the bottom. So take a look at the things that make them sticky right here. Now, I know it kind of looks like real short hair, but if we were to look really closely, they're actually, it's like a little tube with a little suction cup on the very end of it. And that's why we call these tube feet. And each one of the arms, each one of these long arms is covered with hundreds, maybe even thousands of these tube feet. Can you imagine if you had little suckers all up and down your arms? Plus, then you have lots of arms. I only have two arms, but this sea star has 18 or 19 arms. It's got a lot of arms, and so it has a lot of those suckers on it. Do we by chance have a video of um, the the two feet up close. We'll take a look. <gasps> Check this out. Olivia found this great video. So look at this. Now this is a bat star, as I was talking about before. Look, I know it doesn't look like it moves lightning fast, but it is moving. You can even see some of those tube feet at the very, very end, reaching out. And this is how they're able to explore and know the world around them. And so they can stick to walls. They really like rock climbing, I guess. Uh, they can stick to these walls. They can also, um, they actually also sort of like breathe through their two feet here. So we can see all these arms are covered with, all the way to the very top, those little two feet right there. One other cool thing to notice is look at the actual, the, so this is the bottom, all right? This is the bottom of the sea star, so it's stuck to the rock. You can see the rock right there. So this is actually the top of it, the colored part of it right here. Um, and so it's sort of this peachy color, peachy, orangey color with a little bit of purple on it. And it's actually pretty rough, which I think is really interesting about sea stars. Sea stars have like plates of armor on the outside of them and they don't like to have stuff on the top of them so you'll never really find a sea star that has like algae or or any sort of seaweed or anything growing on it because they don't like that they actually like the plates help keep them nice and clean so and you can see how actually rough and bumpy they can be that's why if you touch them they actually feel really hard um, with the exception of like a leather star a leather star feels soft because it has slightly different outside and some slime on the outside too 
But look at this. All these tube feet right here help the sea stars to move. And it turns out our sea stars, if you were to watch our tide pools um, in our North Pacific Gallery, at our coastal corner touch lab, if you were to actually like watch them like over the course of many days, they actually sometimes will move a fair amount across a day. And uh, that's why when we come back in, sometimes it's like, oh, I didn't see that sea star there yesterday. That's because they actually move around a fair amount. And you can see that right here. All right, maybe let's go back to um, another one of those tide pool pictures and see if there's any other creatures that catch our eye here. So, so far we've talked about the anemones. We've talked about these sea stars that are really good at sticking to rocks because they've got all these uh, tube feet on them. And we'll go back and check out this tide pool image. We're looking again at the above water view. Is there anything else that sort of catches your eye here? Any other really interesting creatures? Hmm. I'm seeing something that's actually kind of spiky looking. Anybody notice anything that's spiky? Did you see them? Here, I'll get a little closer. Right there! Did anybody see that? Is this the only one of these spiky creatures in here? Take a look. Do you see any more? Yeah, it turns out there's a bunch more. If you spotted them, there are, uh, there's a bunch of them down here, too. This one is a purple sea urchin, and then there are these sort of red sea urchins down here, although we do have some really red uh, ones with very long spines. Um, so I think, actually, these might also be purples. It's kind of hard to tell in this video. But we have all those pokey-looking creatures, the urchins. Now, if you were an urchin and you lived in a place that was rocks, filled with water, there was high tide sometimes, low tide sometimes, and waves crashing. What are some things that might help you as a little urchin? Let's take a look at an urchin's body for a minute. And maybe we can figure out, if you were an urchin, what are some things that would help you be to, to survive in this kind of habitat? So great close-up view right here. So look at those spines right there. Hmm. Interesting. Whoa. Wait, I'm... Are you seeing more than spines in there? Take a closer look. I see bright purple spines, but uh, is anyone else seeing this? It almost looks like... Wait. They look like tube feet, don't they? Really long, skinny tube feet. You can almost even see, like, the little sucker on the end right there. Wait, sea stars have tube feet. So it turns out this creature, the urchin, is the cousin of a sea star. So take a look at this picture. Isn't that amazing? So between all those spines, they have tube feet, just like a sea star. Turns out their cousins are all echinoderms. Um, and so they have these spiky uh, plates on them. These are much pokier than sea stars. And then they all have tube feet on them. Do you think the tube feet stick the same way? They absolutely do. And it turns out if you are covered with tube feet, that helps you stick to those rocks. So take a look at the ones on the bottom. Now, how else might the tube feet, maybe how else might the tube feet on the top help the urchin? Because they're not sticking to rocks there. Could it stick to anything else? What do you think? Yeah, now thinking back to the anemone for our inspiration, remember how anemones would grab food out of the water? So kind of the same thing, An, uh, sea urchins can grab food with the tube feet on the top too. The other thing they can do is they can actually grab rocks to like shade themselves, kind of like wearing a hat or wearing an umbrella, carrying an umbrella if it's really hot and bright. So they can actually do the same thing with the tube feet on the top. And sea urchins actually move a fair amount because they have all these little tube feet on the bottom. Now, let's talk about the spines real quick. If you were an urchin, how would the spines help you? It's pretty straightforward, right? Yeah, the spines make excellent protection. So they live in a tough environment. Um, they are round and they protect themselves with those spines. Where do you think its mouth is? Hmm. 
Let's take a look. Any ideas? Where might the mouth be? I don't see a face on this creature. Hmm. Well, sea stars and sea urchins, it turns out their mouth is on the bottom. And so they actually will grab their food and bring it over and slide it to underneath them. And then they'll sit on top of their food and eat it. Like this. So one of the foods that the purple urchin eats is kelp or seaweed like this. And um, they have a little mouth on the bottom of their body. And the mouth kind of works like your hand does. So imagine going like this with your hand, like so turn it upside down. And they have five teeth. And imagine these fingers, your fi five fingers are like teeth. And so what the sea urchin does is its mouth, which looks like this, sort of like if you do this with your hand, they go scrape, scrape, scrape. So that's how they actually eat. So they eat pretty slow. But they eat all day, which is really, really helpful. And so it just goes scrape, scrape, and it plucks little pieces of that seaweed off. And so they can actually um, sit on top of their food and eat. And that's actually how we feed them. We, we just stick it on the top of them. They push it to underneath. Um, and then they sit and eat. And they just do that scraping, sort of like plucking um, action with their teeth on the, on the bottom um, of them. You can see a nice view right here of the mouth right there. Now I know it's really tiny in there, but you're almost looking at a view like the five teeth are like this right here. And so they go pluck, pluck, pluck right there in the middle. So that's that little dot there. Um, and if you look really close, you can actually see there's like little like pieces on that dot. So, and then we have all these tube feet that help it stick. So we're looking at a sea urchin on a, a glass of an aquarium. You can see some of the other tube feet that are sticking out too. Now, I actually wanna show you what an urchin looks like without spines. I just wanna show you the shell or test of an urchin. So come over here. We're gonna look at this side view. of, um, And then this is my um, document camera. This is an urchin test. You can see it has that round shape. Um, I'm gonna zoom way in. What do you notice so far about this urchin test? Yeah, it's not perfectly round, <laughs> as you can see right there. And I've zoomed way in so you can see. So even just the shell of it without the spines has little bumps on it. And each one of these little bumps is where a little spine would stick out. And so you can see it's got all these bumps. So this is the inside shell of a sea urchin. Really, really interesting. Um, the bottom actually, because there's a piece that's broken off, you can see that. But this area in the middle um, is where the mouth would be. So really, really cool specimen right here to be able to see that. All right, let's go back to our um, tide pool page, see if we notice our tide pool image and see if we notice anything else, um, any other interesting creatures living in our tide pool here. Hmm, we got, we did sea stars, we did anemones, and we've done urchins so far. I think in the other image too, we might have had um, a slightly, one more different creature. <gasps> I see something in the upper right hand corner that we haven't talked about yet. Does anybody notice anything that looks a little bit different than the creatures we've talked about so far? And it's in the upper right hand, whoa! right there take a look at that so we have right here this red thing right here that is a sea cucumber and it is actually the cousin of both a sea star and a sea urchin as well and they are a pretty common animal in the tide pool area as well so what's really neat is it actually looks like it's got a couple of spines on it it's just to look tough. The spines are actually kind of soft because it turns out the, the body platelets on the sea cucumber are like on a sea star and a sea urchin, the body platelets are really, really tight. But on a sea cucumber, a little, little bit looser. And that gives the sea cucumber a little bit more flexibility. It can sort of tuck into places like around the surfaces of rocks and things like that. Um, and it also, uh, yeah, you can see right here. You can see though, we have these like sort of spines, but what do you notice on the bottom? 
Oh, hopefully you recognize these are all tube feet, just like we saw on a sea star. So it looks like a little tube with a little foot, a little sucker on the end. And so that is how they move around. And they actually have sort of these modified feeding appendages too. So instead of the plucking that a sea urchin has, um, they actually have these like, it almost looks like frilly little tentacles. They come out and they sort of deposit, they, they touch the bottom and that's how these creatures eat. And they move around on sand and rocks, um, especially sand. And sometimes they'll even grab sand and sort of get the little bits of um, material and stuff that are uh, little bits of like organic material, edible material that uh, is inside of the sand. And they're pretty good at keeping things clean. And so they actually really like to do that. So that is a sea cucumber. Well, today we've had a great experience exploring our tide pool habitats here. I want to thank you for joining us today. We were able to check out the sea anemones and then a bunch of echinoderms, the uh, sea stars, sea urchins, and of course, don't forget the sea cucumber up here. If you want to continue learning today, check out our uh, website that goes with this uh, streaming class, and you'll see we've got some activities on there um, for today. And if you're interested in joining us for the rest of this week, we will see you uh, tomorrow morning at the same time, and hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye, everybody.